Today, we are going to find out the truth. Is an EV on coal really dirtier than an ICE car? Here is our nice, shiny new ICE car. Up against this filthy animal, we have what we would call a zero emissions vehicle. But Subaru, what's up with partial zero emissions? This definition is a bit deceptive because an EV needs a stream of electrons to recharge its battery whenever you're gonna charge it. My experience with coal power was informed by SimCity. The EV isn't looking so hot now, but we're doing a bit of a disservice because we've expanded the definition of the electric vehicle to include the fuel supply chain. Running our Model Y EV on coal appears to actually be cleaner. Think about what goes into making this little bolt. But it gets worse for the Tesla. What if instead of the typical car, we choose something greener? The Prius keeps looking better and better. So hybrids for the win. Its total CO2 emissions are 57% of those of the Model Y. I guess we'll just hang up my EV hat there and we'll call it a day. 18 years is a really long time to wait for a close to zero emissions car. A Model Y will have released less CO2 than the Prius in these states. There were still a few states holding onto the Prius, so I decided to up the ante and go straight to a million. So let's set this up. Gasoline powered cars have bad emissions, but we also know that today's electricity comes from coal a lot of times, and that's even dirtier. So it stands to reason that a coal powered electric car could be dirtier than an ICE vehicle. To explore this, I have a randomly selected internal combustion engine car going up against our not so randomly selected EV. And according to the Bureau of Transportation Statistics, for every gallon of gas that the ICE car burns, it travels on average 24.2 miles, otherwise known as 24.2 miles per gallon. Well, as we know, burning dead dinos produces some smoke, and there's all sorts of nasty stuff in smoke. Broadly speaking though, I like to divide the vehicle emissions into two broad categories. There's pollutants and then there's greenhouse gases. The pollutants, those are the toxic ones. They're bad for the health of people, animals, and plants. Pollutants include things like airborne particulates, hydrocarbons, oxides of nitrogen, or NOx, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Here in the US and most of the Western world, we've been cleaning up these emissions for the past 50 years, and we've gotten pretty good at it. Although there are still some issues here. But the second type of emissions are the greenhouse gases. And as you may have heard, the truth about their inconvenience once or twice, particularly the issues with CO2 emissions. See, while CO2 isn't directly harmful to our health, if its atmospheric concentration changes by a lot, this can really affect the global climate. And this can negatively impact us and animals, our lives and future lives. So here is our nice, shiny new ICE car belching pollutants and CO2 from its tailpipe. But just how much is spewed forth into the world? As the gasoline is combusted in the air, about 73% of the exhaust gas is nitrogen, and that's just inert. 13% is water vapor, and about 13% is CO2. According to the US EPA, one gallon, or 3.8 liters of gas, releases 8.89 kilograms of CO2. Taking this number and then dividing by our average mileage of 24.2 miles per gallon, we get a value of 0.37 kilograms of CO2 released per mile driven, or 22.8 kilograms of CO2 per 100 kilometers. Up against this filthy animal, we have what we would call a zero emissions vehicle. But Subaru, what's up with partial zero emissions? I mean, I guess it's partially zero emissions like right now. So are EVs really zero emissions? Well, it really depends on how you define the term vehicle. If you define the term vehicle as the car and only the car, then yes, as the car drives down the road, it will be releasing exactly zero emissions. But everyone knows that this definition is a bit deceptive because an EV needs a stream of electrons to recharge its battery every night or whenever you're gonna charge it. And unless this electricity is coming from a renewable or nuclear source, there's gonna be CO2 that's released during the production of the electricity. I'm looking at you, Cole, and 
your little brother natural gas isn't off the hook either. Back in 2009, when I started grad school, I was working as a coal energy researcher. And at the time, I was shocked to learn that over 44% of our electricity still came from coal. See, up to this point, my experience with coal power was informed by SimCity. And if you've ever played that game, you know that the coal plants are the first electricity source you build because they're the cheapest. But you want to replace those things as quick as you can because they're so dirty. So how bad is coal? Well, the U.S. Information Administration, or the EIA, puts typical CO2 emissions from a U.S. coal plant at one kilogram of CO2 per kilowatt hour of produced electricity. Looking at our 2020 Model Y, I found that the EPA projects it will consume about 0.28 kilowatt hours of electricity per mile. But this is only the energy consumed during driving, and it doesn't account for any efficiency losses in all of the equipment getting the electricity from the power plant to the car or from the charging station to the car battery. See, after the electricity leaves the power plant, it can travel hundreds of miles across many different wires until it finally arrives at the charging station. As the electricity moves through these wires, any resistance in the wires will cause them to heat up. And this represents an energy loss on the part of the electricity flow. The EIA suggests that on average, about 5% of the energy produced at the power plant will be lost to heat during distribution. But just because an electron makes it to the charger doesn't mean it's gonna get a ride on the big battery. See, EV charging stations are notoriously inefficient. Some of the losses are in the components within the charging station, others are within the vehicle. One group of researchers found that on a typical level two charger at a current of 40 amps, there was around a 12.4% loss due to charging. If we take the Model Y's consumption of 0.28 kilowatt hours per mile and divide by one, minus the 12.4% of the charging losses and the 5% of the transmission losses, we find that for every mile driven, the power plant must be producing 0.34 kilowatt hours of electricity. And since one kilogram of CO2 is released by the coal-fired power plant for every kilowatt hour produced, 0.34 kilograms of CO2 is going to be released per mile driven, or 21.1 kilograms per 100 kilometers. So the EV isn't looking so hot now, but we're doing a bit of a disservice because we've expanded the definition of the electric vehicle to include the fuel supply chain, and we haven't done this for the gas car. I mean, gasoline doesn't just magically appear at the gas pumps. <laughs> See, many years ago, in a land, well, here, a dyno sacrificed its life in the service of your car. <laughs> really, in all seriousness, we don't have to go that far. But there's significant energy involved in converting the dead dinosaur nectar into gasoline. You have the exploration, the drilling, the transportation of the crude to the refinery, the refining into gasoline, and then the shipping of the gasoline to the gas station. Figuring out all of these emissions is really super complicated. And they depend on how the oil is being extracted, how far it has to be transported, and in what way it's transported, and how clean the refineries are. And this is something I'm not going to do, but many people have spent many years looking into this. So. Uh, we'll defer to them. In a report from the Eindhoven University of Technology, they estimate that global drilling for oil releases, on average, 1.24 kilograms of CO2 per gallon of gasoline. If you refine within Europe, another 1.23 kilograms of CO2 is added per gallon, with a final 0.12 kilograms added for transportation to the gas stations. In total, we're looking at an additional emissions of 2.59 kilograms of CO2 per gallon of gasoline before the fuel has even reached the car. Dividing 2.59 kilograms per gallon by our average fuel economy of 24.2 miles per gallon, we get additional emissions for the ICE vehicle of 0.11 kilograms per mile or 6.6 .6 kilograms per 100 kilometers. So running our Model Y EV on coal appears to actually be cleaner than running the typical gas-powered car. 0.34 kilograms per mile versus 0.48 kilograms of CO2 per mile. But what if instead of the typical car, we choose something greener? Something like, say, a 2020 Prius Eco. The 2020 Prius Eco gets an incredible EPA combined mileage of 56 miles per gallon. With 8.89 kilograms of engine emissions per gallon of gasoline and 2.59 kilograms of fuel emissions per gallon, the Prius produces 11.5 kilograms of CO2 per gallon of gasoline. And then dividing by our mileage of 56 miles per gallon, we get per mile emissions of only 0.2 kilograms of CO2 per mile, or about 40% less than the per mile emissions of the Model Y 
on coal. But it gets worse for the Tesla. There's one source of emissions that we haven't looked at, and this is the emissions that are wrapped up just in making the car. Like the emissions from making fuel, manufacturing emissions are really complicated. For instance, think about what goes into making this little bolt. First, you need to find some iron ore in the ground, which means a lot of prospecting and research. Then you need to get some heavy equipment to dig it out of the ground. After that, the ore needs transporting to the steel mill, and this could be the whole way across the world. The steel mill separates the iron from the ore in a huge furnace, and this is likely coal-fired. Then the iron is converted to steel before sending the steel to the foundry for forming into the bolt. Next are all of the forging and machining steps required to cut the bolt and its threads. Once the bolt is made, then it needs to be shipped to the manufacturing facility where the cars are assembled. It's attached to the car, and then finally the car is shipped to your local dealership. And this is just for a simple bolt. And I'm leaving out all kinds of steps, but my point here is to show how complicated and how much energy is involved in just making a bolt. Now imagine all of the complex, specialized brackets, engine components, electronics, glass windows, lights, tires, and all the other components that are really essential in modern cars. To try to get a handle on this, I looked at over half a dozen reports and, and websites on vehicle manufacturing emissions, and I found that most estimates put light vehicle manufacturing emissions somewhere between 5,000 and 9,000 kilograms of CO2. The value for a particular vehicle, it's really gonna depend on the size of the vehicle as well as its complexity and the particular materials it uses. To make it simpler for our purposes here, I'm going to use a value of 7,500 kilograms of CO2. It really doesn't matter too much what number we choose, as the emissions will be the same for both ICE vehicles and EVs. In the case of an ICE vehicle, this number does include all of the components of the car. But in the case of an EV, it does not include the emissions produced during the battery manufacturing. And this, unfortunately is not insignificant. For an EV with a small battery, like the Nissan LEAF with a 40 kilowatt hour battery, the battery production emissions are only about half those of the rest of the car, or about 3,800 kilograms. But for our long range Tesla Model Y with a 75 kilowatt hour pack, we're looking at about 7,600 kilograms of CO2 released during production of the battery. And this is pretty much the exact same number as the emissions for the rest of the car. So this means that before any miles have been driven, our Tesla has already produced more than twice as much CO2 as a typical ICE vehicle. But let's put this all together using a little graph. In the vertical direction, we have CO2 emissions in tons of CO2. And just to clarify for those of us on Freedom Units, one ton here is a thousand kilograms. Anyhow, along the x-axis is the number of miles driven, and yes, I'm mixing unit systems, just deal with it. At zero driven miles, each of the cars has released CO2 equivalent to its manufacturing emissions. About 7.5 tons for the ICE and hybrid cars, 11.3 tons for the LEAF, and 15.1 tons for the Model Y. As we start driving each vehicle, the LEAF and Model Y increase at about the same rate, with the average ICE car increasing more quickly. We also see that the Prius increases the least per mile. At around 33,000 miles, the ICE car surpasses the lifetime emissions of the LEAF, and around 56,000 miles, it surpasses the Model Y. Meaning, as long as the coal-powered EVs are driven for more than 56,000 miles, they will both have less lifetime CO2 emissions than the average ICE car. Meanwhile, the Prius keeps looking better and better, and by 100,000 miles, we see that its total CO2 emissions are 57% of those of the Model Y. So hybrids for the win. I guess we'll just hang up my EV hat there and we'll call it a day. <laughs> Why would Elon call EVs sustainable transport? Well, it's all about this little phrase on my plot, 100% coal-powered EVs. Virtually no electric grid is gonna be 100% coal-powered. Even in the most coal-heavy US state, which is West Virginia, only about 91% of the electricity is generated from coal. Some states like California, they only get 0.12% of their electricity from coal. And even in my state, Pennsylvania, it comes in quite low at 16.6%. Nationally, around 23.5% of our electricity comes from coal, 39.2% comes from natural gas, and 37.3% is produced by renewable or nuclear sources. And this is really important because for the same electricity production, natural gas releases 41% of the CO2 that's released by coal. 
And then the nuclear and renewable sources, those can be classified as emissions free if you're not considering the emissions related to their construction, which we haven't been. What this amounts to is that there's huge reductions in the per mile EV emissions when we adjust our graph for the current US electricity grid mix. And we see that by 11,000 miles, the LEAF has a better lifetime CO2 emissions than the average ICE car. It takes the Model Y twice as long to hit the same point, and that's about 22,000 miles. But more interestingly, by 60,000 miles, the LEAF has beat the Prius. And by 100,000 miles, the Model Y is about to do the same thing. Remember that the Prius represents just about the cleanest gasoline powered car out there today, and it's significantly more efficient than the typical ICE car. More promising, over the next 30 years or so, the EIA projects the grid will become cleaner and cleaner in the US. The coal generation is projected to fall from 21% in 2020 to below 13% in 2050, and the natural gas percentage also falls, but just slightly. The biggest change is in the increase of nuclear and renewable sources, and that's rising from about 40% today to above 50% in 2050. Now, I'm sure you can guess these trends aren't as dramatic as I'd like to see, but they're at least in the positive direction. And this leads us to a particularly interesting point about EVs. As the grid cleans well into the future, an EV manufactured today becomes cleaner and cleaner relative to an ICE vehicle manufactured today. To account for this, I adjusted the lifetime emissions curves for the year the energy is used in. And it's difficult to see, but the EV curves have begun to bend downward as future emissions become cleaner according to the EIA trends. It's a little more obvious if we extend this out to 2050, which takes us close to 400,000 miles. What we do see is that the points where the EV and the ICE curves intersect, which is the point where the EVs become cleaner than the ICE cars, has moved to the left. And this means that the EVs are becoming cleaner than the ICE cars at an earlier point in their lifetime. Remember, this is only for cars produced today. ICE cars produced in the future will be more efficient than today, and this will make the per mile emissions lower. But future EVs will likely be more efficient as well with reduced battery manufacturing emissions. So I don't expect the overall trends between the two vehicle types to change that much. But what would happen if the grid got cleaner than the EIA projects? Let's say 100% renewable and nuclear by 2050. And for this, I assumed an annual compounding increase in renewable generation of 3% with natural gas and coal decreasing in proportion to their current ratio. Unfortunately, for a car produced today, we don't see a significant change in emissions until 2039, after which the emissions curve really begins to flatten. But there is another option that's available today, and it involves powering your EV using solar panels on your house. And if you were to charge your car using this 100% renewable energy, the CO2 emissions curves become horizontal lines on day one. Well, they're not perfectly horizontal because there's still gonna be emissions that are wrapped up in the production, maintenance, and disposal of the solar panels. And granted, I haven't accounted for any of this in any of the electric sources up till now, but hey, it's small and it makes our findings more conservative. So let's go with it. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory puts this at about 0.04 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hours produced. And as you can see, this is by far the best possible scenario for reducing transportation emissions today. Now, I'm guessing a lot of you might want to go solar, but you really don't know how much you're going to need and what it could cost you, and even if your home would be suitable for it. This is why I am really excited to be partnering with an online solar service called Energy Sage. Energy Sage is the largest online platform for US homeowners to learn about and shop for solar, battery storage, and community solar. Personally, my biggest concern with going solar is gonna be the cost. And Energy Sage works really hard to save you money, with some people saving as much as 20%. They do this by allowing multiple installers to offer simultaneous offers that are competitive quotes and then you get to choose from them. And they make the whole process super easy. After you create an account, you spend a few minutes entering information about your address, moving the map pin to your roof, and then entering your typical electric bill or even uploading a copy of your bill. Then Energy Sage goes to work and they contact installers. After just a day or two, I had several quotes to compare from installers in my area. And Energy Sage also offers tons of information about all the typical questions you might have as you're going solar. One thing Energy Sage does that I particularly like is the new program that allows you to go solar 
even if you rent or your home isn't suitable for solar. It's called Community Solar, and it's a service where you can subscribe to a collective solar field. Community Solar isn't available everywhere yet, but it's, it's just great to see that this is finally happening and that there's a company that's helping to set up the whole community solar system. If you are interested in solar at all, just go check out my landing page on the Energy Sage site. There's a link down below. If you go and do this, it's not only good for the environment, but it helps if you use my link because then that helps support these videos. So next time someone tells you a coal powered EV is worse for the environment than their ice car, just push those glasses up your nose. Don't take my word for all this though. Earlier this year, MIT released what they call Carbon Counter, which directly compares lifetime emissions and costs for a wide variety of ICE, hybrid, and electric vehicles. I'd highly recommend it. Also, if you're in the US and you'd like to compare emissions among vehicle types in your particular state, the Department of Energy has a simple interactive tool that is helpful for that. It takes into account different electricity generation sources to compare EVs, plug-in hybrids, hybrids, and ice-powered cars. And just for fun, I pulled data from this tool for the lower 48 states and added the manufacturing emissions for our Model Y and the Prius. I found that after 50,000 miles, a Model Y will have released less CO2 than the Prius in these states. In the rest of the states, the hybrid is the best choice, and the ICE car isn't even close. After 100,000 miles, the Tesla is better in quite a few more states, and further gains are made by 150 and 200,000 miles. There were still a few states holding onto the Prius at 200,000 miles, so I decided to up the ante and go straight to a million. You can't accuse me of cutting a car's lifetime emissions short. Surprisingly, this didn't change the map too much, as these states still produce the majority of their electricity from coal. And I'll leave it up to you to draw your own conclusions on what to do about this, as I feel it's pretty obvious how to flip these states red. I've put together a quick playlist of some other great videos on EV emissions up here. And if you wanna check out another one of my videos, that's down here. I do have some more stuff lined up that I'm really excited about. So stay tuned and stay subscribed. And I will see you in the next garage video.